Today, we are announcing the initiation of what we're calling the BC vaccine card. Tonight, the Delta variant is hitting British Columbians hard, so they have to carry proof of full vaccination. Well, the first action that I, I would have pushed for is not to call this, uh, this election in the first place. And the Green Party of Canada is hitting the election trail with hopes of winning more seats. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. It is now day 10 of the federal election campaign. And despite what the parties promise, this entire election comes down to what you, the voter, chooses to do at the ballot box. Our Kent Driscoll joins us from Iqaluit, where he has been looking into just how you get registered to vote in Canada. Kent, how do you get your name on the voters list? All right. The first requirement that almost everybody knows, you have to be 18 years old and a Canadian citizen to vote. Next, you need to find out if you're already registered. Uh, there's a simple link on the Elections Canada website and you can find all that information right there. You can also request a mail-in ballot from that site. Now, here's an important note about the mail-in ballot. Once you register to vote mail-in, that is how you are voting. You can't ask for a mail-in ballot and then show up in person to vote. It's either or. And if your mail-in ballot doesn't reach Elections Canada before Election Day, your vote won't be counted. Now, if you are registered, you should be getting a voter information card in your mailbox. If you filed your taxes, you already had a chance to register to vote. There's a little box you could check off on the return that would share your information with Elections Canada. Finally, you can register on Election Day. Now, you just show up with a piece of government-issued identification with your name, photo, and current address on it. That's option one. Now, option two, you just need a form of photo ID and a document with your current address, like a utility bill. And finally, if you know a poll worker at the poll where you're going to vote, they can attest that you are indeed who you are. Back to you in Winnipeg. Thanks, Kent. Well, in the run-up to the vote on September 20th, APTN News is hoping to speak one-on-one -on -one with all of the leaders of the federal parties. Today, we're joined by Annamie Paul, the leader of the Federal Green Party. Ms. Paul, thanks so much for taking some time for us. Uh, the Green Party has yet to release a, a full platform for this election, but reconciliation with Indigenous peoples was at the top of the 2019 party platform. Does that remain a major component for you and the party this time around? And what does reconciliation look like for you? Uh, first, yes, and, and thank you very much for having me. And absolutely, uh, you know, we, we can't build a, a future uh, if we are not willing to uh, do the work to reconcile ourselves uh, with um, the legacy uh, that continues to cause so much harm. And certainly, given who I am and uh, the history of, of my own people and the Black diaspora, uh, I feel that very strongly and I know how important it is to do that work. And the entire Green Party knows how important it is to do that work. And so absolutely, we are very committed uh, to it. Um, we have a, um, a brand new uh, reconciliation and Indigenous Affairs critic, um, Adina Young, uh, who is a member of the Haida Nation and lives out uh, on the traditional territories of her peoples out in um, British Columbia. And so you can expect to see that from us. Uh, reconciliation means to me, uh, whatever it means to the Indigenous peoples of this country, I'm here to be guided by uh, their leadership and to uh, offer myself as an ally and, and our platform uh, of the par our party in any way that would help. Uh, addressing the, the climate emergency is always being at the core of the Green Party and you know we're experiencing a, a devastating summer of fires across large parts of this country. Uh, what action is the Green Party pushing for? Well, the first action that I, I would have pushed for is not to call this, uh, this election in the first place. Uh, I think that people uh, who, who are evacuated from their homes or people who are choking under smoke or people who are under evacuation alerts have a very hard time concentrating on things like elections and on the issues. Uh, and I think that everyone in a democracy as much as possible should be given the opportunity to get to know the parties and their positions uh, before having, uh, having to vote. So this is really unfortunate timing uh, if we care about uh, people 
making informed votes. Um, we, we know that the way to avoid uh, even more extreme uh, fire events in the future uh, is by doing all that we can uh, to limit uh, global warming. Uh, some of it is locked in and that's very painful to know, uh, but some of it isn't. And so if we don't want more frequent forest fires, uh, we've got to make sure that we mitigate uh, global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then we also need to adapt. We need to take the knowledge of indigenous peoples in their own territories um, and the best scientific knowledge and also make sure that uh, we're doing all we can uh, to limit the, the impact of forest fires when they happen as well. Your party currently has 11 Indigenous candidates nominated for this election. Uh, what is your pitch to Indigenous people who are thinking of, of voting this time around? To vote, uh, because it makes a difference. You know, we have seen a lot of talk with very little action for many, many years. We have seen uh, parties, uh, both elected and not elected, make commitments and then contradict them immediately. Uh, there is no question that there has been uh, work that has been done, uh, but uh, it's not sort of a buffet. You don't decide that you're going to respect uh, self-determination and sovereignty in this situation and then completely ignore it in another. And we see that, for instance, when it comes to the Mi'kmaq fishers out uh, on the East Coast uh, and their, their, their struggle to just earn a moderate living uh, through uh, um, exercising their treaty rights. We see it um, with the coastal gas link and the NDP allowing um, sovereign territories uh, to be invaded uh, for that pipeline project. Uh, so you have to do the work all the time. Uh, and uh, that's really what, uh, what the Green Party is proposing. And so every Green that's elected uh, makes a big difference in terms of having an ally um, for, for the issues that matter most. The Green Party's had uh, much publicized, uh, you know, infighting or issues in, in recent months here. But uh, how confident are you that the Greens can increase the number of seats in the House of Commons this time around? Well, one thing I know is that it certainly won't be for a lack of trying, whatever the result is. Um, we're all working very, very hard across the country. We have uh, exceptional green candidates running uh, all over the country, um, powered by volunteers and members, uh, and uh, they're going to be doing everything that they can and have already started uh, to make sure that they're presenting a strong green option to the people in their communities. Um, so what we, but the part that we can control is what we do and how hard we work uh, between now and September 20th to earn uh, the privilege of representing our communities. And then ultimately it will be up to the voters. And I hope that they will take a look at the, the records of parties who have had power and ask themselves, uh, did we get the change that we expected? Uh, and if they, if they feel like no or maybe not, uh, then that they'll choose to vote for an alternative and, and send some new voices to Ottawa with the hopes of getting a new result. Ms. Paul, we'll have to leave it there, but appreciate you taking some time for us here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And for more on the election, you can head over to our website, 8btnnews.ca. In other news, Ottawa police are asking residents to help them locate an Enoch woman who hasn't been in contact with her family since June. This is 27-year-old Tina Atagutak, who was last seen in Ottawa's Lower Town neighborhood back in June. She's also known to spend time in the Byward Market. She is five foot tall, thin, and may have a limp after a recent hip surgery. Anyone spotting Tina is asked to call the Ottawa police at 613-236-1212. Time now for a quick break, but still to come, the list of people who must be vaccinated for work continues to grow. Employees who work with vulnerable populations must be fully immunized by October the 31st or undergo frequent COVID-19 testing.
Welcome back to the pandemic now in the Northwest Territories is facing the biggest COVID-19 outbreak yet with 220 active cases, 190 of which are in an isolated region. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs has this update. 220, that's today's number. The COVID-19 outbreak in the Northwest Territories includes multiple communities, daily new exposure notices, and now the loss of an elder, the first death from the virus in the NWT. Elder was a very active member of the, the elders that had uh, just tremendous amount of knowledge on history and traditional ways. That's Tommy Kakfui's voice, chief of Fort Good Hope Dene Band, a community under a 10-day lockdown with 84 active cases. We have uh, established an emergency medical team and uh, we've su suspended all passenger flights in and out of the community except for essential workers. The 600 person community of Fort Good Hope is in the Saw 2, ground zero for the outbreak. 190 of the 220 COVID-19 cases are in the remote region. Chief Kakfui says they're taking it day by day and supports are coming in. The, the team has just been working 12 to 15 hour days and the, the cooperation from, from residents has been just awesome. I mean, we have a curfew and everybody is complying with it and uh, wearing masks and, and staying home. Yeah, we have delivery service. We have uh, food and food hampers that are brought in, but Coville Lake sits at 74 cases. That's half of the community's population. A vaccine clinic has been set up in the community for the last week. Isabel Orlias, a community member, just received her shot today. Well, we're stuck at home, so I think the kids are happy to have both parents home all day. Um, and I think that the community is doing a good job following the rules. You only see the essential workers like running around delivering groceries or whatever necessities we need. Elsewhere, Yellowknife sits at 27 active cases. The Canadian Red Cross is in the capital now for orientation before being deployed to communities as requested by the GNWT. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. The Manitoba Métis Federation and the Manitoba government both announced COVID vaccination plans Tuesday. The announcements come with the arrival of the fourth wave of the pandemic. With more, here's Daryl Stranger. As the fourth wave of the Delta variant carries on and cases rise among those unvaccinated, COVID vaccine policies are being revealed. The Manitoba Métis Federation announced a mandatory vaccine policy. Our government has implemented a policy that requires all our staff, elected officials, affiliates, contractors, board members to be fully vaccinated. Also making an announcement regarding vaccinations Tuesday was the province of Manitoba, but they stopped short of making vaccines mandatory. All frontline provincial employees who work with vulnerable populations must be fully immunized by October the 31st or undergo frequent COVID-19 testing. This includes healthcare providers, educational and early learning, early learning and child care providers, public servants and agencies who work in high risk, risk settings, and Manitoba justice officials who work with vulnerable people and in correctional facilities. The province will re-implement indoor mask requirements across Manitoba in the coming days, including in schools as Delta variant cases rise. In previous waves, Really, the, the lockdown, the uh, intense public health restrictions were uh, really our only tool. Uh, now we have a much better tool, and that's vaccination. An expanded list of activities and services that can only be accessed by a fully vaccinated individual will also be coming to the province in the coming days. Daryl Stranger, ABT National News, Winnipeg. And people in BC will need to show vaccine passports if they want to go to a restaurant or concert. 
Health officials say they want to increase the vaccination rate in the province. Currently, 75% of eligible British Columbians are fully vaccinated. In a press conference Monday, BC Premier John Horgan and health officials announced the new order. That will go into effect on September 13th. It will require proof of at least one COVID vaccine dose for people over the age of 12. If in order to enter businesses and other indoor venues such as restaurants, weddings and concerts, on October 24th, proof of two doses will be required upon entry. People will be able to access a copy of their proof of vaccination online. Today, we are announcing the initiation of what we're calling the BC Vaccine Card to make sure that when you go out to non-discretionary activities like uh, ticketed sporting events, um, indoor concerts, movies, wherever there is non-discretion activity uh, that you can go to uh, with the confidence that those around you have also taken steps to protect themselves and their families, the BC Vaccine Card will help us get there. And in a surprise announcement today in British Columbia, Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry says residents 12 and older must begin wearing masks once again in all public indoor spaces. BC had ended its mask mandate in early July, but since that time, the Delta variant has surged, creating concern in several provinces. As we move into the fall, we're starting to congregate more in indoor public spaces. And right now, we know that this virus is transmitting in some of those indoor public spaces. So this is an additional measure. We've said all along, masks are one of the additional measures that we need in certain circumstances, particularly when we're in uh, places that may have poor ventilation, where we're around people whose vaccine status we don't yet know. The announcement was unexpected. It came at a press conference regarding the upcoming school year where it was announced all teachers and school staff will be required to wear masks as well as students in grade four through 12. Time for another quick break. Coming up, we'll speak with uh, an indigenous doctor breaking some serious ground. Stick around.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This stunning drone photo was sent to us by our viewer Matt LeMay. This is the view high above the Métis Crossing Cultural Center located near Smoky Lake, Alberta. Looks beautiful. We can send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a peek at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 24 with showers for St. John's, 29 in rain in Charlottetown, 17 in Kujuwak, 15 in Nain, 33 in Montreal, 27 with showers for Shibugamu, 28 in rain in Sault Ste. Marie, 29 for North Bay, 25 in Cloudy and Thunder Bay, showers in 18 for Sioux Lookout, 15 with rain for God's Lake, rain and 18 for Norway House. 18 with showers for Winnipeg and Gimli, 16 with rain in Dauphin. Sunny and 19 in Regina, one degree warmer in Saskatoon. 18 under the sun in Uranium City, 20 in La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, sunny and 23 for high level, Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie. 22 under the sun in Edmonton, 20 in Lethbridge. 22 in Vancouver, sunny and 23 for Victoria. 21 under the sun in Prince George, make that 22. 15 in showers in Dease Lake. 15 with rain for Old Crow, 16 in rain in Whitehorse. 20 and sunny for Yellowknife, 18 in Norman Wells. 5 for Saks Harbor, plus 8 with rain for Polituck. 17 in Whale Cove, 16 for Arviet. Zero in Resolute, eight in a glue lick. Well, it's a historic first for the Canadian Medical Association. They represent doctors in Canada and Dr. Alika Lafontaine is their new president-elect. He joins me now. Dr. Lafontaine, thanks for being with us and uh, congrats on your new role. Can you tell us a bit about that role and the association you'll be representing? Yeah, absolutely. So I've recently been confirmed as the Canadian Medical Association president-elect. So the president-elect is one of three years that uh, the leader of leaders of the CMA have in impacting healthcare change and advocacy across Canada. I'll become CMA president in August of 2022 and then past president the following year. Uh, you've talked about, and we hear a lot about, uh, systemic racism in the healthcare system in the past. Uh, well, what are some of the barriers as you see them and how do you think you might be able to address them in your new role? So I, I think one of the great things that happens whenever someone from an excluded or disempowered group becomes a part of decision-making tables is that they can bring a new perspective and new insights into those decision-making tables. Uh, it's one thing to listen and understand, it's another thing to live and understand. And what I'm hoping to do is bring my experience as an Indigenous person, you know, someone who is Métis with Cree and Anishinaabe ancestry, as well as Pacific Islander from my mom's side, um, and bring that experience of what it feels like to be disempowered and experience those racialized, you know, instances in the healthcare system into the work that we do at the CMA. You know, and one of the things that I've realized going through, you know, racialization on both sides as a patient and as a provider is that the shared experience of disempowerment, you know, having someone take ideas about who you are and what you represent and what you're about and kind of projecting that onto you is something that all patients experience, but indigenous patients in particular uh, experience at a, at a much more magnified sort of way. You know, we recently had uh, Mary Ellen Terpelafon's big uh, uh, report that took place in British Columbia, and I think uh, we could apply that to nearly any province and territory in this country. Uh, how big of an issue should systemic racism in healthcare be in this coming election? So I think one of the things to recognize when it comes to racialization in healthcare is that it exists everywhere but it's not necessarily a big enough problem in all places that people access care. Uh, one of the things that we really learned from the Insight Report and from reports that have been you know, published and shared for many years is that the lived experience of racism is real and it has direct impacts on patient care. 
Uh, I'm excited that the federal government um, has indicated a willingness to address this issue. I hope regardless of which political party ends up moving into the office uh, and, and running the government after this election, that they continue with that commitment. And I believe that it'll have enormous impact on Indigenous patients. Well, Dr. Lafontaine, we'll have to leave it there. But again, uh, congrats and good luck uh, going forward with the new role. All right. Thanks for having me. Big deal there. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, visit our website, apTNnews.ca. That's where you'll find all of our election coverage as well. Stick around, an encore presentation of Face to Face is next. But first, here's some video of a game I'd like to know a lot more about. It's the traditional medicine game called Fireball, and it looks pretty interesting. I'm Dennis Ward, thanks for being with us tonight. Have a great night.